Hi there. Thank you for tuning in. As we know, Venezuela has been um, the, much more in the news these days because the crisis is just really boiling over. Uh, that's really actually been 20 years in the making. And uh, since I live in Miami, I speak fluent Spanish. Uh, I know um, dozens of Venezuelan exiles and regular Venezuelans that have fled here than the leaders. So I want to share with you uh, why I believe that this is actually an emergency uh, and, and, and to carefully explain why I believe that uh, upwards of 35 million Venezuelan lives are at risk of starvation and how we got there, why it's caused by Mr. Maduro. And then you be the judge whether you think that U.S. intervention, if all else fails, is, is, uh, is warranted to prevent uh, 35 million people from starving to death. Because that's really where, where I see it's at. I mean, it may, may be less, right? Look, even if you say it's half of the 35 total million people in Venezuela, uh, what is that, 17.5 uh, million people? If, if, if this was going on you know, in Africa and so on, we would want to intervene in one way or another, right? So let me just get down to the nuts and bolts of what's happened in the past 20 years. This is gonna, I'm trying to make this under five minutes here. Um, there's really two major issues. Number one, how is it that uh, Venezuela, which has certainly the, the largest oil reserves in the Western Hemisphere, some say the world, I don't think so, it's, it's Russia, but um, Saudi Arabia. However, it's, they should be so rich. Can you imagine if you were the leader of Venezuela and you had all these oil reserves under you? So the first thing that you would not do is fire all of the state-run, the company that uh, uh, Venezuela has is called PDVSA, Petroleros de Venezuela. Uh, you wouldn't fire the 20 thousand plus employees of the state-run oil company, right? Because that's the goose that lays the golden eggs. Venezuela is a uh, petroleum-based economy. Uh, you could do a better job uh, as president of Venezuela. This is the sad truth here, right? I'm getting right to the nub of this. You could do better than Mr. Hugo Chavez did while he was alive from 1998 to about 2012. Uh, or Mr. Maduro, his handpicked successor, has done since. You who are watching this would, could, you would do a better job. Uh, because number one, you wouldn't fire as Mr. Maduro, as uh, Hugo Chavez did circa 2004, all of the, virtually all of the employees of the state-run oil company knowing that you depend on these people to get the, uh, that they're the goose that lays the golden eggs, right? I mean, if he wants to run some of the American oil companies out of the country, I think we can all see that could be justified. But he uh, went far beyond that. And now, he, check this out. This is what separates you, would make you a better leader uh, of Venezuela than either Mr. Chavez or Mr. Maduro. And that's why, all right, so he, he fires all these people and he goes a step further. He goes on national television, he vilifies them, he demonizes them, he says to the, uh, no other company can even hire them. And I, I know some of these people, right? I had it explained to me in great de detail by Nuvia Patin, who worked for uh, the state run oil company, right? PDVSA, PDVSA. Uh, and so Mr. Chavez demonized them, and she, so she says, if you hire any of these people, your company will be nationalized and you won't have a company, we'll take your company away from you just for hiring uh, one of the 20 plus thousand PDVSA employees I just fired, he says. Can you believe this? So she had to leave Venezuela because she, you know, uh, helps provide for her family, right? And so do we wonder how it is? See, this is the most essential thing, and I've got this under the five minutes. Uh, why is Venezuela having starvation um, in the midst of, of, of wealth, of the oil wealth, and that's it. You just got it right there. Now, the second aspect brings, involves Mr. Maduro, uh, who um, replaced Mr. Chavez upon his death circa 2012. What has he done? 
uh, he's wrecked all the farms, so they have no food. How did he do it? Um, part of this is part of, you know, let's just give some credit here, the communist ideology called collectivization. Under the communist model, you know, whether we love it or hate it, I mean, we're trying to understand what's going on here. Um, the state takes over the farms, takes over everything, really, uh, and says we are, you know, the beneficent provider. We will make sure everyone's treaty, whatever they're doing. So, so Mr. Maduro comes in and he confiscates the farms. Uh, difference is he doesn't know how to run them, right? So the farms fall into disuse, disrepair, uh, and collapse, and there's no food. Okay, so you get you you get the whole Venezuela crisis in a nutshell. Now there's a lot of other things going on there. Mr. Maduro happens to be uh, a, a corrupt individual. He's been convicted in absentia by the uh, Venezuelan Supreme Court in exile of doing bribes with Odebrecht, you know, which brought down brought down the government of Brazil and Peru. Uh, he's apparently involved in narco trafficking. His instincts are not good, uh, but that's really almost peripheral. You've got the two key things, and I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, so, what's the result of these two um, sabotages of the Venezuelan economy? Uh, the firing of all the oil, state oil company employees, so it can't be run properly, can't make the money they need, and the dismantling of all the farms. Uh, it, I compare it to Reverend Jim Jones of Guyana. Those of you who are old enough remember circa 1978, excuse me, uh, whenever it was, 1980. He um, did a mass suicide in Guyana, which happens to be next to Venezuela. They all drank uh, poison Kool-Aid. If you remember that story, uh, a thousand people died, including Reverend Jim Jones. But what I'm saying is that in a, in a metaphorical sense, uh, Nicolas Maduro, the dictator of Venezuela, is doing the same thing, but to 35, up to 35 million people. There are thousands of people dying every month in Venezuela, thousands. And it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. There's three million that have left due to starvation and so on. Um, some are trapped, they're enemies, so-called by Maduro, he won't give them passports, they can't leave legally. Um, this is uh, an enforced starvation. In fact, there's even a word for it, Holodomor. You could look that up. Um, so when you see, uh, if, imagine, if you will, that those who can remember Jim Jones, if we knew this was going to happen ahead of time, would we intervene in Guyana to rescue those people that he, he had mass suicide? Will we intervene? Which is, which is better? Now, here comes a decision point for you, and then I'll leave this. What do you think is preferable? Letting this slow motion mass suicide by Mr. Maduro of uh, 35 million people take place, or even if we have that and say 17.5 million people, do we want this uh, to take place? Do we have any obligation as the strongest country in the hemisphere to prevent it? That's really the question. Because I live here, because I know these people, I don't want to see that happen, and I don't even want to be responsible for not trying to support, not trying to reach out to people like you and spread the word, what is really going on there. In, in my personal opinion, I've, I've long since concluded that uh, intervening to save people's lives on such a large scale, millions of people, is, um, you know, that's, that's humanity, that's what... That's what we do, right? If, if, you, if you know millions of people's lives are at risk, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to intervene? But that's your decision. I'll leave it in your hands.